it's great to have an opportunity to talk with Andre today. Um, how many of you seen, have seen him on, he was on CNN this morning. He was, <laughs> he was on Frontline uh, recently on their uh, expose on the elections. He was on the Colbert Show, where <laughs> Colbert went to Russia and examined the, the room in the dossier that we all have heard about. Um, so he is one of the most sought after uh, intelligent, Russian intelligence analyst uh, types, journalists that we uh, have on the planet. Uh, we're lucky to have him here today. Uh, since the theme of the Humanities Festival is beliefs, I thought I would start at 30,000 feet and talk about the beliefs of the Russian leadership for a moment. Um, they, I, I think when most of us see global events uh, like the Arab Spring, like the color revolutions, we see it as kind of a natural evolution of these societies. Um, but the Russian leadership, Andre, sees it as what? Uh, first of all, thank you, Jerome, and uh, thank you, everybody, and thank you for having me and inviting me to, to Chicago. I'm really happy to be in this great city. It's just my second time here, and I'm absolutely happy and thrilled. Uh, well, given your question, uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, why, just after the Arab Spring, we got the Moscow protests in 2011-2012, and uh, it was really strange for me to be in Moscow and to see that the Kremlin got so frightened by these protests. Why? Because actually it was not such a big thing. Uh, yes, we got some people on the streets, uh, but at the height of protests, in December 2011, we got only probably 100,000 people. And given that we have more than 14 million people living in Moscow, it's not such a big figure. So why uh, Putin and his people got so frightened? And I think one of the reasons is uh, what you mentioned. It. It's, um, for them, it's a kind of uh, strategic game. Uh, they believe that they've been in some sort of arms race uh, with the State Department starting in probably in 2000, uh, maybe 2001, uh, with the first color revolutions, uh, first in Belgrade, then in Ukraine, in Georgia. Why? Uh, because uh, for the Kremlin, it was important to maintain so-called political stability in the country, to suppress all kind of uh, dissent. And already by late 1990s, they suppressed usual means which you use if you want to mobilize people, which is opposition parties or trade unions. Uh, this was suppressed by 1998, 1999. And then all of a sudden, uh, we got color revolutions. And for the Kremlin, it was a sign that the State Department, the US State Department, I came up with a new idea, with new toolkit, how to mobilize people uh, without, say, opposition parties or trade unions, how to use uh, youth movement uh, launched very well quickly, and how to use these movements to then to mobilize people. That's why we got scared uh, already in uh, the beginning of uh, 2000, and we wanted to find a way how to fight back. Uh, so they launched their own uh, pro-Kremlin youth movements, just to have some people at ready. If there is some crisis, you can send them to streets. And uh, they were quite happy for a time, I would say for 10 or maybe, yeah, probably for 10 years. And then, all of a sudden, they got the Arab Spring. And some uh, Hillary Clinton's advisors, like Ali Cross, made some statements, uh, he said when he was in London that uh, social media today is the is Che Guevara of today. And of course, in, in Moscow, uh, this statement was seen as a proof that the US State Department came up with the new toolkit. And now, you can mobilize people uh, without any offline organization. For that, you don't need opposition party, you don't need a trade union, you don't need even a youth movement. You just can use technology. And, and that's how, how crazy is this? Is this a crazy um, idea that the Russians are having, or is this a legitimate fear? I, I, 
when you look at something like uh, Serbia and uh, Slobodan Milosevic got voted out of office. He, we, he was not bombed out of office. He was, and there was a lot of organizing that U.S. Uh, affiliated institutions did to create the momentum that helped him get voted out of office. That, that's a pretty legitimate thing that happened that would not go down well with Russia. Yeah, absolutely. And with social media, it's even more scary. Uh, the thing is that uh, the Russian security services, uh, they've been trained in a way as if they have any kind of crisis, any kind of crisis, they were trained to look for three things. Uh, first, to identify an organization, then a leader, and then a channel which actually which funnel money from, say, abroad, from outside to this organization to start something. The problem with uh, social media is you have no organization. There is no offices of this organization. Uh, you don't have a leader. And uh, it was quite interesting when, when we got the Moscow protest, uh, Russian opposition leaders they were usually somewhere. Some of them were sent to jail. Uh, some of them were uh, not in Moscow. So this movement, uh, this new movement, was absolutely leaderless. And there was no money coming from abroad. And that scared the security services because it, it means for them that they cannot predict uh, what actually is going on. Uh, they have no time to react. And we got a statement from the deputy head of the FSB right after the Arab Spring uh, when he said, look, we should admit we have no, to, no means to deal with uh, Facebook. We just don't know what to do. And three months later, we got the Moscow protest. And of course, for people in the Kremlin, it was a sign that for many years, they invested in, uh, in the Russian security services. They gave them a lot of resources, a lot of money, a lot of privileges. And these guys are not ready. We have a real crisis. We have people on the streets, and they are not ready. So they needed a new strategy. They needed a new way to go. Absolutely. And they, everybody always looks at them and says, well, this is the same old strategy in a new package. It's the it's compromise, it's go after, uh, muddy the waters. It's, it's a, something they were doing uh, uh, in Soviet times all the time. But in this case, um, well, details matter. Uh, for instance, we all now are talking about Russian trolls, right? And we got trolls in Russia already by 2006, probably. But back then, these trolls uh, were usually uh, used on a social platform known as Live Journal. And it was a very popular bloggers platform, but the thing about this platform was that you can leave uh, your comments anonymously. That's why trolls immediately seized this opportunity and started uh, attacking people like journalists or liberals or experts. But right uh, in the middle of the protest, for some strange reason, uh, lots of Russian liberals moved from live journal to Facebook. Not because of some political reasons, just because uh, Facebook looked much more attractive. Uh, it helped you to be connected with your friends outside of the country. It was a very fashionable thing back in 2011. And trolls, they found themselves in a kind of uh, on a dry. Because on Facebook, you cannot leave, you cannot post anything anonymously. And that's why, at the crucial moment, uh, the Kremlin found out that they cannot rely on the security services, and they also cannot rely on their trolls. Because right at the, in this moment, people just moved from live journal to Facebook. Uh, the Russian authorities decided at that time to try to control the internet? That they would, they would take a shot uh, at being China-like? Yes, unfortunately, uh, they decided that the internet now should be under control. And uh, starting in uh, 2012, uh, we got uh, so called the internet filtering system, which actually means uh, a huge black list of banned websites. And uh, it's, it's enormous. Uh, now we have more than uh, 4 million websites blocked. Uh, so it's really huge. Not all of them are blocked for political reasons. Uh, most of them are blocked by mistake uh, because the Russian system of filtering 
is not very sophisticated. It's not like Chinese system. And uh, so usually we, what we have, we can block your IP address. Uh, and IP address is something which might be used by many websites. So you have, for example, your website hosted on this IP address. And uh, with you, uh, it might be about 1,000 other websites, completely innocent. But because this IP address would be blocked, it means that all other websites would be blocked too. That's why we got this big number. And also, uh, the Kremlin decided to do something with uh, the Russian system of uh, surveillance. It became much more uh, advanced. Uh, and now we have a combination of Russian technology combined with uh, Western technology of uh, surveillance. Uh, so it's much more uh, effective. And uh, the thing is that the Kremlin also found a way how to use these technologies, not only, not just spying on people, but uh, to send a very strong message. So they can pick up some victims randomly, send them to jail, uh, and then made a statement that these people were identified thanks to our technologies. And that would send a very strong message. To, uh, to people who actually who, who are active online. Uh, I wanted to talk about the Panama Papers and the reaction that the, um, as all this is going on, the Panama Papers kind of uh, come out. And I, I had to kind of look back and say, well, I forgot what, uh, what, what did it say about Vladimir Putin? Uh, but, but one of his close buddies was really um, exposed in the Panama Papers uh, this cellist uh, who shouldn't have billions of dollars has billions of dollars. Um, and he, he, that really set him off. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely true. Uh, we actually, we dig it into this story for the new edition of our book. Uh, our publisher here in the United States, uh, Public Affairs, asked us to add a new chapter uh, to the Red Web. So we decided to make, well, actually to write the whole new chapter about what actually happened uh, in uh, 2016 in the United States and about the Russian interference. And uh, when we looked into this story and, uh, well, we spoke to our sources, it looks like we are dealing with a very strange miscalculation from the Kremlin. Uh, so the thing is that Panama Papers is a big international uh, journalistic effort. Uh, actually, it's, um, initially it's a trove of documents from uh, some offshore companies, company uh, based in Panama. Uh, and uh, this uh, trove was leaked to some journalists and they decided to, because it's huge, uh, they decided to invite journalists from many countries uh, to work with, uh, with archives about fake countries. Like you have some Russian accounts or some Russian names, so you invite some Russian journalists to look into these documents. And that's exactly what actually happened. Some, some very good Russian journalists, uh, friends of mine, uh, were invited to work with documents. And they found out that a cellist, uh, for some strange reasons, uh, controlled millions and millions and millions uh, dollars in these accounts. And, when he was approached by journalists and asked it, look, are you a businessman? He said, no, I'm just a cellist. And given the fact that he was known to be a personal friend of Vladimir Putin, well, everybody started speculating that probably that's where you need to look for Putin's personal money. So these journalists, uh, when they finally found out all these proofs and evidence, uh, they decided to do what any journalist do, uh, to, to pose a request to ask for comments. So they sent, sent some requests to the Kremlin, but precisely this moment, uh, a second group of hackers were already in, uh, in the system of uh, DNC, of uh, Democratic National Committee. And uh, it looks like, as far as we know, the, uh, the Kremlin and Putin was already briefed about what was in, uh, in Podesta uh, emails. And as probably you remember, the biggest thing in Podesta emails is uh, the information about paid speeches uh, made by Hillary Clinton at Goldman Sachs. So apparently, Putin was briefed that 
uh, Panama Papers was founded by Goldman Sachs with some involvement of Hillary Clinton's people. It was a wild conspiracy theory, but he believed in this theory. And for him, it made perfect sense uh, because uh, he believed that she had intervened in, in, in his elections back in 2012. Uh, so he just probably thought, look, it looks like now she's against me uh, trying to launch another offensive, now attacking my personal friends. And it's, uh, it's a very sensitive thing in Moscow. Uh, everybody in Moscow, I mean journalists know, that you, uh, if you cross this line, if you start digging into the uh, family of Vladimir Putin or his personal friends, that means that uh, actually you are at some risk. It's, it's a very uh, sensitive thing for, for Vladimir Putin. That's why we, we know nothing about his daughters, actually. Uh, and so that was the moment that Putin, uh, in, the, in the beginning of April, he was briefed about these, uh, these things and Podesta emails. Simultaneously, his office uh, got some requests from journalists about Panama Papers. And immediately that, well, construct, build this conspiracy theory. And uh, he went very emotional. Uh, he started attacking journalists. Uh, he, uh, he said that uh, one of the newspapers uh, which published uh, Panama Papers expose was funded by Goldman Sachs. Uh, he attacked lots of people. He said they are all, uh, all these journalists are on payroll of uh, US State Department. Uh, when we got WikiLeaks saying something like that, uh, next day Putin uh, said, well, now we know this for, for a fact because WikiLeaks said that it's, it was an operation run by US State Department. So it was a kind of uh, strange miscalculation uh, by the Kremlin and based on, on emotional reaction. So that's where they went and weaponized the DNC emails that because, they, because of this emotional reaction that Vladimir Putin was having to something that was probably unrelated to the, yeah, the Democratic National Party. And that was uh, the second question we, we had. We wanted to understand when precisely we got this moment when uh, they decided to weaponize this information. And uh, finally, we identified a meeting uh, uh, which took place on April 8th. It was one of the meetings of the, of the Russian Security Council, uh, and uh, eight people were present. Uh, six of them uh, had some experience with the KGB, and uh, the, the well, the, officially, it was about um, something very innocent, something about military pensions. But uh, lots of sources told us that actually one of the questions they debated was how to fight back. And two weeks later, uh, the domain name of uh, dcleaks.com was registered. Um, did, they, did they have expectations about what they could accomplish with this um, mission, do you think? I, I, you know, the stuff that we've been finding out just recently about how the, the ads they bought on Facebook, that you know, the people ended up buying on Facebook, they seem so detailed and sophisticated. We're going to target Texas secessionists uh, to inflame them because they'll be the right ones. Is this a function of a sophisticated uh, incision, or is this a combination of the technical selling prowess of Facebook to um, combined with uh, you know an average hacker I, I, how do you read what happened there I think we uh, didn't have two stories uh, one of them is uh, a very emotional reaction to Panama Papers and the idea that now we can use these emails and uh, leak them and uh, we believe well, I still believe that the idea was not to promote Trump, but to weaken Hillary Clinton, because actually nobody believed in Moscow in Trump. Uh, everybody thought that uh, because these guys actually believe in conspiracy theories, it means they, they believed that the American establishment already decided everything about the US election. 
and the Hillary Clinton is destined to be as the next president, the only thing you can do, you can try to harm her. You can try to make her a very weak uh, president. Uh, but at the same time, you have a second operation, uh, which started, I would say, long ago when we have, we got this uh, uh, propaganda outlets launched. Uh, and it started many years ago. It started in 2006, 2008. Uh, when we got first Artsy, then Sputnik networks, and, and some trolls factories. And the very first troll factory uh, was launched in 2014, so long before the election. And it looks like these people made lots of mistakes, uh, but finally they found a way how to use social media. Uh, and uh, well, RC, for example, for some time was uh, one maybe the most popular uh, channel on, uh, on, on YouTube, uh, which tells you something about the sophistication uh, of these people. But they had 10 years to try, and finally they, they knew how to do these things. I, and um, what do you think the reaction of, about US institutions should be? I mean, now we've got Google and Facebook and Twitter in front of Congress. And there are um, all sorts of ideas about um, restricting them and legislating them. And uh, there's ideas about restricting RT in the United States. And uh, what, uh, is there a effective counter to what has happened? To be honest, I personally, I'm, I feel very, very uncomfortable. Uh, about these ideas because um, for me it's, uh, it means actually censorship, to, to make it very clear. And um, actually, uh, it's uh, the, the, the way we, we started talking about these things uh, reminds me of, uh, actually, of the Kremlin's language. Uh, many years ago, in, actually in 2000, when Putin came to power, he started uh, with something like that. He said, look, uh, now we are in the war in Chechnya, and it was a big thing back then in 2000. And he said it, it's a, it was a second Chechen war, and his message for for public was that we lost the, the first Chechen war because of journalists, because of foreign media. So now we need to restrict uh, foreign media and Russian media uh, and uh, to prevent terrorists from using media against us. And that's the way this idea was actually, the idea of censorship was, so, was sold to, to the Russian audience. And unfortunately, I was very young then, uh, 24 years old, but I had already four or five years of experience. And I remember uh, it was a disaster. I mean, uh, we, we lost our audience completely. Uh, lots of people turned against journalists. Uh, they told us uh, that, uh, that because of you, we have terrorists in our towns, and we have all these terrorist attacks. And uh, we accepted the idea of censorship. And uh, we've been living with this for how many? 70 years now. Uh, so I think the idea to try to control the content uh, generated by media or social media is a very dangerous idea. Uh, I still believe that probably the best way to deal with this problem is to, well, to use journalism. I mean, well, you have uh, some activities of the Russian uh, government here. You need to investigate these things. You, need, you, you have lots of good journalists, and they are doing a really good job. And we still have some very good Russian journalists, uh, thank God. And they also try to expose, uh, say, Trolls Factory in Russia was exposed by Russian journalists. So you have lots of people who actually can do these things. But to introduce some sort of, uh, I don't know, restrictions on social media. And also remember that these things could be then picked up by authoritarian countries. It's always good to have some example uh, and to say, look, we are doing exactly the same. We got internet filtering in Russia in, in 2012 and the pretext that we just follow the example of the British. Uh, the, uh, the, the Russian message was uh, that the British have a system of uh, filtering 
uh, child pornography, some pedophile content, this kind of thing. So the Russian government said, look, now we, have, we need the system of internet filtering. And firstly, they introduced this under pretext of doing exactly the same, fighting child pornography. And in, actually, in a year, it was about political websites. So you just need to remember what you do here could be accurate and could, could be picked up by some countries like China, Russia, Iran. Naturally, I want to believe in good journalism winning and carrying the day. How do you get it into people's hands, though? It seems like the problem is that the water is so muddy now that you don't get good journalism into people's hands. I read a statistic. Uh, yesterday that 46% of Trump voters believe that Hillary Clinton ran a sex ring in a pizzeria in New Jersey. Where it, it, good journalism is now winning there. Where there's, uh, you know, so there's something going on that we, where there, it's not making the connection. Uh, I totally agree with you, but it's, it doesn't start with, uh, with Trump. Look, uh, why WikiLeaks is so popular and was so popular? Just because of that, because lots of people lost uh, their trust in journalists because they believe that now they need to have a direct access to documents, not to our stories based on these documents, but to the documents. That's why uh, lots of people trusted WikiLeaks. Uh, that's why a lot of uh, people decided to trust Snowden and, and, and other whistleblowers. And it started long ago. We lost trust. That's our problem. Uh, we need to find a way how to fix it. Um, what do you make of um, the Mueller investigation? And uh, they, uh, do you think they can prove some kind of collusion between members of the Trump administration and um, Russia? There, there's. Um, it seems like the Trump administration leaks so vociferously that they would be unable to keep any kind of secret. <laughs> what I like about this investigation is that it produces new names almost every two weeks. And actually, it's good. I mean, it means that then you might have journalists uh, investigating these leads. And uh, now we have some information about some professor in London who actually had some meetings and uh, uh, with some Trump's people. And uh, I mean, it's, uh, for, for journalists, it's great because now you can start doing something. Uh, well, so if, say, they keep going, uh, um, that would be great. Uh, for instance, uh, when we got this um, FBI investigation about Russian hackers, I was really thrilled because the very first time we got two FSB, Russian Federal uh, Security Service, officers on, uh, on the FBI most wanted list. And that immediately, because, of, uh, because they uh, were involved in uh, hacking uh, of Yahoo uh, uh, servers in 2014. But that triggered a reaction in Moscow. Uh, some people were arrested. Uh, lots of people are very nervous. And it's always good for journalists. Because when people are nervous, well, it could be risky. Uh, it could make things very dangerous for you, but at the same time, sometimes it might actually provoke some leaks, uh, some information uh, you can get. And, uh, well, and after this uh, FBI investigation, we got some new names, some new information about uh, uh, the criminal connection and, and a relationship between, say, the security services and criminal hackers. So already we had some results. With uh, this investigation you mentioned, we already have some new names. So I think finally it's, it helps us to understand and uh, probably, uh, maybe not very soon, but maybe in a year, maybe in, a two, uh, in two years, we can get the full picture. I wanted to ask a couple questions about our, our internet companies, um, Google, Twitter, um, Facebook, and, you know, I think for a long time people granted them a lot of, uh, uh, they were very affectionate towards them, thought they would be their defenders, thought that they would be, uh, you know, the people out there uh, keeping things open and, and free. And, you know, slowly we've had this experience to be, and now maybe enormously skeptical about them, 
Uh, you've been on a campaign, all these companies um, house their own data, and Russia wants them to house their data inside Russia. And uh, Twitter, uh, it looks like, is, agree is about to be the big, uh, of the groups I named, that is going to agree to this, apparently, in just the, the last few days. Uh, what, how, do you, how do we handle these companies and what they share and don't share with uh, governments? Uh, it's a very sensitive topic, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it started in 2014 uh, mostly because of uh, Snowden revelations. And Snowden triggered a new debate in the world, not only in Russia, but uh, also in Brazil, in Europe, namely in France, and in Germany. And the idea was that, uh, well, look, we live in a world where we all use American technologies. I mean, you might be in Russia, uh, and it's not about cables, it's about services that you use. We all use Facebook, we all use Twitter, we all use Gmail, which means that, uh, say, American intelligence uh, has so-called natural advantages. They can actually use these uh, services to spy on people. And of course, it's a big concern for everybody and uh, for these countries, uh, but the problem is that what we wanted to do, uh, we wanted to actually to land uh, these services on their soil, not because we want to protect their citizens, or at least it's not true for Russia. Because in Russia, the idea is actually to get access to these servers. Uh, that's because that's the way how the Russian surveillance works. Uh, the Russian system of uh, surveillance online is uh, extremely intrusive. And essentially, it's um, a system of backdoors. Uh, every Russian in internet service provider should have a special black box installed uh, in a communication rack uh, with a cable uh, coming directly to, uh, to the local branch of the FSB. And this black box is actually a backdoor. We can actually say front door because it's uh, totally um, legit according to the Russian legislation, and it's uh, it's help, it actually it it lets the FSB to to just to mirror everything coming well, on your cable, but they have some technical problems, and these technical problems are with Gmail, with Facebook, with Twitter, with uh, WhatsApp and uh, other global uh, services. Why? Because everybody now uses a special protocol called HTTPS, uh, with the S meaning secure, which means that your traffic is actually encrypted by definition. You don't need to do anything about it, it's by definition. And the problem here is that you may use a Russian system of surveillance, all these black boxes, to intercept your message, but you cannot deceive it. For that, you need to have access to servers of Gmail, of Twitter, of Facebook. And that's exactly what the Russian government wants from these companies. And uh, in uh, 2015, we got a special legislation uh, called a data localization law. And it was introduced under pretext of uh, we need to protect personal data of Russian citizens against NSA. And, uh, and, and that was the moment we got this strange game started. Uh, it's, a, it's a game. <laughs> so we have these three big companies, Google, Facebook, and Twitter. And uh, only Google out of three companies has a Moscow office. Twitter and Facebook, they have no presence in Russia, officially. So the game is how to uh, convince the Russian government that one day they would relocate their service and actually do nothing. So they play this game for years. As I said, with uh, legislation we got back in 2015. Still, the situation is like before. So we do not have servers of uh, Google or Facebook or Twitter in Russia. So what they do, they just send some high-level representatives to some high-level talks in Moscow. Uh, they try to comfort Russian officials. They send some letters. They promise something. And, uh, and, and that's all. So they quietly uh, sabotaging <laughs> this legislation. And, and at the same time, time trying try not to make a public statement. 
And of course, it's very frustrating for both for the Kremlin and for, for the activists in Russia. For the Kremlin, because we, we, we actually we, we get nothing so far. But it's also very frustrating for the Russian activists because it means that we have no guarantee that one day these companies might decide to change their mind and decide to comply with the Russian legislation. So far, they, you, you might have some private meetings with this guy, and very privately, off the record, they could tell you, well, Andre, we can guarantee we decide not to move our servers. But it's off the record. I mean, nobody could, well, actually, one day we can decide and, and just change their mind. Uh, so that's, that's the game we have now. Uh, the latest news is that uh, Facebook uh, was threatened to be blocked if they failed to, uh, to move their servers by the mid of uh, 2018, so next year. And uh, there was some news about Twitter, uh, but given the fact that all these news are generated by the Russian uh, internet censorship agency, and they were caught many times of saying something, but achieving nothing, so I would be very skeptical that actually it, that means that Facebook or Twitter uh, already decided to move a service to Russia. So should we still think of these companies as legitimate uh, preservers of our privacy? Or <laughs> I, uh... Well, the problem is that uh, uh, here I should be very cynical and practical. The thing is, of course, if I would live in the United States, I would be very concerned given all these uh, uh, strange relationships and uh, uh, the situation here. But I live in Russia. For me, my concern is not NSA or CIA. My concern is my security services, because they are interested in my private communications. And they are known to use these uh, things, I mean, hacking into email accounts of journalists and activists to then to attack you. We have a very long history when we have people uh, hacked and their emails, their videos, private, private information leaked to some programming websites, and then we have some crim criminal investigations against them. So that's why uh, lots of people in Russia, they still trust global platforms uh, against local platforms. They still believe that the immediate threat is something which is based in Russia, and that's why they relatively, uh, they believe that relatively global platforms are safer for them. Of course, it doesn't uh, solve the global pro uh, problem of uh, how to uh, protect your privacy. But you need to put this in, in the context. Uh, I, I wonder if you could say something about being a journalist in Russia now and getting through to the Russian audience. There, it seemed like for a long time the game in Russia was television and, you know, Vladimir Putin came in and bought television and made television uh, a state-oriented thing. Uh, do websites like yours and uh, other news outlets, uh, do they have more leverage now? Do they have a bigger audience? Do you get, are, are, are things uh, changing in some way where people are getting a lot more news from the internet, from your sources, from international sources, from uh, looking around? Uh, there are two things about which I wanted to say. First is um, the Russian system of uh, censorship is uh, very unlike the Soviet system. In the Soviet Union, the idea of uh, the Kremlin was to prevent people from getting information. That's why we have all these demonstrations. That's why you might have your radio set, but some of uh, the frequencies would be disabled. And if you have these frequencies on your radio set, it means that you might be sent to jail. Uh, and you have no access to, say, Western newspapers. Uh, but right now in Russia, if you want to buy, I mean, online uh, subscription for Washington Post, you can do that. If you want to find an information about the Russian military presence in Ukraine, you can easily find it. Uh, the idea of the Russian, of the present Russian uh, censorship is to prevent you from talking about these things. They try to destroy any places when you can have public debate about sensitive issues. So if you have, say, your newspaper and you have a comment section, that would be a target. Uh, 
either patrols or by, by the authorities which can use uh, information posted on, on your comment section as a pretext to launch an investigation against you. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, that uh, the Kremlin uh, behaves completely diff in a different manner when they, are, when they believe that the situation is stable or if they think that there is some sort of crisis. If they are in, in the crisis, they, uh, they begin to attack everybody. Uh, our website was attacked and uh, hacked in, during the protest. It was not a big thing for mobilizing people. It's a very special kind of website. It's about the Russian security services. So nobody actually thought that our website could be used to, I don't know, to, I don't know, to promote some ideas and to get people to streets. But nevertheless, it was hacked along with uh, a number uh, of other websites. So when the Kremlin found itself in a crisis, they got really scared, get scared, and uh, they became very aggressive. It's time for questions. We're going to take questions from the audience and um, see a couple hands right off the bat. Do you have an opinion on the factual accuracy of the dossier? And will it be possible for Bob Mueller to identify steel sources and to speak to those sources and get any kind of admissible testimony in support or, uh, of those assertions? Uh, we checked some of, uh, we tried to check uh, the steel dossier, and uh, uh, there are some mistakes there, uh, some obvious mistakes. Uh, for example, uh, some, some names uh, are wrong, some description of some departments of uh, the Interior Ministry, the FSB, uh, they, they mixed. Uh, but, uh, the way the political decision-making process is described uh, is very, I would say, very correct. And the thing is that the Kremlin these days is a very strange and complicated thing. It's not about only about people who have some position in the government. It's also about some surprising people who have no official standing, no official role in the government. Uh, Putin is surrounded by people who might be his friends, uh, might provide, for example, one guy is extremely important and he just provides catering uh, to the Kremlin. And he was put in charge of, uh, of running this uh, troll factory. So you have a surprising mix of people and they could one day come to the Kremlin with some solution, say, like, we know what to do with Syria or we know what to do with Ukraine. We know what to do with the US election. That's why uh, right now the foreign policy of Russia is so unpredictable. Because it's about these strange groups of people and all of them have some access to, uh, to Vladimir Putin and his, uh, his immediate circle. And that's the way uh, it described it in the steel dossier. So for me, it rings true. We also try to check some names. Uh, of people who are in charge of, uh, say, uh, defining as a Russian internet policy, and uh, uh, this is quite correct. So I would say that at least partly for me, this dossier is correct. Uh, the problem is, of course, that some allegations, like about this hotel, I just I don't know how to well check this information how to find any evidence to support this, uh, uh, these allegations. Uh, and uh, how to identify these sources, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think that lots of these sources, and most of these sources, should be in Russia. Uh, so how to get them to testify here, I think it's, a, it's a very, well, it's absolutely impossible. And also what you need to understand is uh, lots of things happened in Russia after the election. Uh, well, a lot of things happened here, I mean, in the United States after, after the elections, but we got lots of things uh, in Moscow, too. And one of the most important things, which what actually happened, we got some people sent to jail. Uh, we got uh, the biggest, the most important uh, cyber branch of the FSB completely destroyed. We have a head of this uh, department fired. His deputy 
expired. Two of his uh, most important people sent to jail. And it means that in a society, when everybody gets used to hear and try to understand what might be the next Kremlin's move, it means that a lot of people are not really, really cautious. Uh, if you now try to, for example, we try to talk to Russian cyber experts, it would be almost impossible. People got scared. And it's a big thing, actually. Uh, the Kremlin uh, sent this very strong message that uh, now the Kremlin discouraged any kind of contact with, uh, say, Western cyber community. It's, uh, it's a big thing, and of course it prevents you from, from getting any information from Russia. Uh, thank you. I admire your courage. Um, how difficult is it as an investigative journalist in Russia to get good information and at the same time protect yourself against disinformation as well? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I've been doing these things for almost 18 years, uh, starting in 1999, which means not only experience, but it means that some of my sources, uh, actually, I got these sources back in, in the beginning of 2000s, and they developed some trust in me. Uh, and uh, so that's the way how you can check your information. Uh, also, what we need to remember is that the Kremlin and the Russian security services, they are not fortress, impenetrable fortress. Uh, actually, we have a lot of people uh, who are not happy inside of, uh, of the FSB. Uh, we have some whistleblowers. Uh, but unlike American whistleblowers, they are unhappy not because they believe that uh, the American freedoms are in danger. They are unhappy for some basic reasons. Uh, they are unhappy about their uh, salaries, about their apartments, about their pensions. So the way we uh, work, and that's my experience, is uh, you have this guy coming to you uh, well, well, complaining about his pension or his apartment, and you sit with him for days, literally, listening to his, all these ideas about his apartment, and you know that it should be three rooms, not two rooms, and it's about days and days and days. But finally, you have a chance to ask your question, and you might get some, uh, some answer. And then you need to get to another source and to try to check this information. It's, it's very, I mean, uh, you spend a lot of time with these people, and uh, it, it well, it takes months sometimes, but finally you can get something. But of course you're absolutely right. The biggest problem is that you can get some information which is not real information, and sometimes it might be unintentional. Uh, some people from the FSB, uh, because they, of a very special way they are trained, they are inclined to believe in some conspiracy theories. So you can get some guy, he might be a colonel, so you might think, well, he, has some, he should have some access to some information, and he could give you some, 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 some news about what's going on in the Kremlin, and you think that he, might, he should know something. But actually, it's all invented in his mind because he believes in conspiracy theories. That's the problem. Next question, uh, possibly our last question. We'll see how we do with time. Hi, I wanted to ask you, I thought the biggest concern the Russians had was NATO expansion as... NATO has gotten closer and closer to the Russian territory. They've had increasing security concerns, and that goes way back to the Russian history. Also, as Obama tried the pivot to Asia, which also started to encircle a lot of the Russian interests, I thought that was their biggest concern. Not the election of Hillary Clinton, maybe. Uh, I would say that partly you are right, uh, and uh, it was a big thing for Moscow uh, uh, with new members of NATO. But these people, that's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. But people in the Kremlin, they always feel they are on defensive. So you might see, you might try to like list all uh, recent actions of the Kremlin, annexation of Crimea, uh, involvement in Syria, uh, the Russian medal in, in the US election. And it looks like a list of offensive operations. But for the Kremlin, it's defensive operations. Why? Because they believe they are in a constant, under constant threat from the West. 
and they just try to find a way how to respond. For instance, the annexation of Crimea was not about land. It was about how to uh, respond to the U.S. government's attempt to uh, withdraw a leader of a country which is loyal to Russia. So you cannot do anything on Maidan, uh, and well, the Kremlin tried and failed. So what you can do, you can grab some land and send this signal to other countries like Kazakhstan uh, that if they want to change their political regime, they should think twice because there are some ethnic Russians living there too. And uh, Syria operation was a response, again a response to, uh, to the sanctions. That was the way Putin believed could be a way to, uh, to force the United States to forget about Ukraine, forget about the downing of MH17, uh, MH and uh, move on and, uh, well, and, and leave the sanctions. Uh, the US uh, election, uh, Madeleine, uh, was justified, again, uh, because it was a response to a personal attack on a personal friend of Vladimir Putin, and given the fact that we have an upcoming election next year, uh, well, Again, they really believe that we just respond. Uh, well, actually, last week, I think we got this uh, excellent example, just another example of this kind of uh, mentality, when Putin said that this uh, new, um, new information we got uh, about the Russian athletes and, uh, and, and, and a new doping scandal, uh, we got this, this scandal now because we have the upcoming election in, the, in Russia. And that's the way the United States are preparing for the Russian election. So we always try, we, we, all, we always believe that we are on defensive. And uh, that's the problem because it's very emotional. And you never know. You might try to think uh, rational, uh, rationally. You might think that probably uh, with NATO uh, we should have do things uh, differently. But you never know what kind of thing could trigger these paranoid reactions. That's a problem. That and does conclude our program. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.